Thank you. My name is Andreas Ferber. I'll be speaking about machine learning accelerators today. I'm going to start with a brief introduction of uh, what machine learning is and neural networks in particular. Then I'm going to talk about ways to accelerate machine learning, followed by, well, of course, software as the main point, um, and uh, a bit of an outlook of how this might be used and what some of the context here um, is. Now, if you're expecting that this is going to be a talk where you're going to walk out and know how to um, do some machine learning or deep learning coding in Python, um, this is not it. I'm going to focus very much on the hardware software interfaces here. And uh, whenever you think that this presentation might not give you the full detail, there may be um, either additional explanations or at least website pointers in the paper. Starting with a brief introduction. So artificial intelligence um, is kind of a high level term that people like to throw around. And uh, what we really um, usually mean in practice is machine learning. And uh, um, here you can have a artificial neural network represented as a graph, in this case, a um, directed acyclic graph, um, where the individual um, nodes represent the neurons of a brain and the edges, the synapses. And there are weight factors um, associated with individual um, neurons. Now, um, those uh, nodes are organized into layers. As you can see them from left to right, you start with the input data that you provide as kind of individual, well, call them variables um, here on the left-hand side. And uh, then there is um, a number of hidden layers in between and ultimately an output layer. In this case, of course, this is a very tiny example. And uh, as you have more layers, um, the network becomes deeper and therefore the term um, deep learning that you can find in various, well, marketing materials, I would say. Um, what is kind of sketched here on the left-hand side is that if you have an edge with a weight factor of zero, that kind of is equal to not having that edge. And if you only have uh, one edge going into that node with a um, you know, factor of one, in this case, um, then that is basically like an identity mapping from one layer um, to the next with regards to that node. And similarly, because there is um, no um, edge connecting this node, it's essentially the same as if it had um, edges to all other nodes in the next layer with factor zero. The mathematics on that are kind of sketched on the right-hand side. So um, you would have a sum of all the um, uh, weight, well, it, a weighted sum of the um, input edges um, and an activation function applied uh, on top of that. So that is mostly for um, avoiding uh, negative values. Uh, when propagating that uh, value on, there are um, several um, defined functions. Um, the rectified linear unit is one example there, um, which is essentially um, shown here as, um, well, a mapping to either zero or the actual um, value. Now, one particular type of uh, neural networks that, uh, well, is frequently encountered are so-called convolutional neural networks, which are used for image recognition, among others. And uh, the idea here is that instead of um, starting with like an arbitrary um, structure of the network, some um, knowledge about um, the structure of that data is employed. For example, that it is, well, a 2D image. Um, so that it's, you know, not just like a random sequence of numbers, but that there is some structure and like some um, neighbor relations between individual nodes, um, as well as that if you actually have a color image that uh, as sketched here on the left-hand side, you will actually have like three color channels. Um, that you can then process separately. Um, and well, in the end, over time, um, essentially, you have this kind of pyramidal um, shape where you have this uh, triangle where over time, the, um, the number of nodes per layer are monotonically decreasing um, until you hit um, some kind of uh, final um, fully connected layers as uh, was shown in the um, previous example. 
And yes, there's uh, these convolutional layers um, that um, are then basically applying some kind of filter kernel, not to be confused with the Linux kernel, to um, the input data in order to um, yeah, um, create a feature map from the original um, pixels. And uh, there may be pooling layers, and of course, those can reoccur um, over time. Doesn't need to be just uh, one of them um, to then, you know, like scale down and compress the image information and ultimately try to do um, some conclusions from the data. And one such conclusion could be that you have like um, one node per um, desired outcome. So, like, is it a parrot? With what probability? Is it a cat? Is it a dog? Something like that. Um, and then there for particular types of such questions, you will find um, standard models like, for example, ResNet 50, ResNet 101, ResNet 152, um, that will be describing what kind of layers the uh, model um, contains. Um, and for example, that it will have like grayscale colors only and a particular fixed um, input size. Or you could have like not just uh, one node per outcome, but for example, you could you know like have um, four nodes to describe a bounding box for region of interest, like you know x y coordinates, width and height, and then what uh, the uh, likely classification of uh, that box is. Or you could do the same for like each pixel of the image and decide well, is this kind of you know like where the um, yeah. Uh, where where the the speaker is and what is the wall or you know like where exactly is the um, the shape of the pedestrian if it's a car that is uh, using this for um, image detection. There are other types of uh, um, neural networks that are described, such as for example um, recurrent neural networks, where you then have um, cycles within the graph to um, allow for. Um, time-based information, like when you're doing video analysis or um, speech um, recognition, other forms of natural language processing. Um, and another form, then a specialized form of recurrent neural networks is spiking neural networks. Um, those are explained um, in more detail or slightly more detail in the paper. Now, moving on to accelerating. There are three ways in principle that you can um, accelerate um, this process. And um, one, of course, is if you're doing the calculations on the CPU, then you could think up new um, instruction set extensions that um, are simplifying and ideally also um, optimizing the um, program code um, for particular of those mathematical operations. Um, Another idea would be to um, have some kind of um, accelerator block or um, add-on card um, that you would simply um, have the um, operations done by a different processor instead of um, your main CPU in particular when you have little cores or on an edge device, maybe not so powerful ones like think Cortex-A53 um, for ARM. Um, or you could well use um, edge computing per se in that um, you simply um, move the data processing from your um, kind of like receiving system to somewhere along the edge of um, between the data source and your current system and have it um, done by um, some other component. Um, I'll have some examples of that um, slightly later. So let's start uh, briefly looking at the CPU before we can get to the actual accelerators. One topic um, that is um, very abundant here is a floating point calculation, as you were seeing with the fractional uh, weight factors that I was showing in the previous model. So um, as models grow, people are, are uh, have been concerned about, for one, storage space for all those um, intermediate data, as well as the processing time um, involved with um, floating point um, computations. And as such, um, the trend has been going to um, half precision 16-bit floating point numbers. 
And uh, what you can see here is like a comparison of different floating point formants with the um, sine bit, the exponent bits, and the mantissa bit, the mantissa being the fractional part um, of the number. And uh, what you can see here is that um, the essentially in the classical IEEE um, floating point format, the number of exponents bits keeps uh, decreasing. And uh, there have been attempts then to um, have slightly more. So um, if you compare the um, FP16 format here, the um, half precision, and the FP32, the single precision floating point formats, then you will notice that there is only five bits for the exponent over here. Um, and a new brain float format had been um, proposed by Google to then have the same number of um, exponent bits and therefore an equal range to 32-bit floating point numbers, but with a storage um, space of only 16-bit by having um, less mantissa bits over here. Um, similarly, well, IBM has proposed a format that is kind of, well, in between um, B float and FP16. And well, NVIDIA has kind of taken the best of both worlds by taking the um, the same exponent size as 32-bit uh, point numbers and the same precision as the um, half precision floating point numbers, um, which is giving, well, an odd number of bits. I have no idea how they do that really in hardware. Um, but uh, mainly we will be talking here about uh, the bfloat 16 format that some of you uh, may have encountered in the past um, service packs. Also worth mentioning is there is, at least in theory, a uh, another um, floating point format called POSIT with uh, multiple lengths and a variable uh, number of exponent and uh, mantissa bits, which is then controlled by so-called um, regime bits over here, um, although I'm not aware of a practical um, implementation of that in hardware yet. So, what have people done with this? Um, I mainly, of course, um, will be focusing on ARM, which I'm mostly familiar with. So um, there have been um, optional features added to, for example, here, the um, ARMv8.2 um, specification, architecture specification for um, FP16 support editions. Um, RISC-V are still working to um, finalize um, an extension for um, half precision floating point numbers and a number of vendors have been adopting the um, bfloat 16 um, starting with uh, intel was one of the first to actually pick this up um, power has adopted it um, arm has adopted it and well risk 5 uh, not yet there is a task group um, if anyone is interested in following what is happening and some vendors um, have um, adopted that as an extension. This is essentially circling back to the explanation of uh, calculating the um, activations for individual nodes. Um, so you could, uh, given the uh, multiplication and addition, have the idea to use a MAC unit or um, fused multiply accumulate unit um, to speed up that uh, um, calculation, which is kind of depicted here on the right-hand side. And uh, instead of just having, you know, like one, you could actually have a full um, systolic array to calculate like a full um, layer um, of activations, um, which then over time, well, gives you like a um, vector matrix uh, multiplication um, if you then have that um, for, for a full um, neural network. And uh, even that then is getting like SIMD instructions to do that like in, uh, well, more or less one go. Um, listed here um, some of the um, features um, that have been added to um, ARM over time. Now, um, this one is kind of interesting. So IBM have taken a hybrid approach between um, CPU instructions on the one hand and an accelerator block on the um, other hand um, for their upcoming successor to the um, IBM Z15, the IBM Telum. Um, and, uh, well, you have a whole CISC instruction, the NNPA facility, as it's called. Um, and um, this 
instruction is then interacting um, with an accelerator that is on the chip. So there is one accelerator available for eight cores on one chip. And then you might be aware there is like two chips are combined to form a socket and then a, a four sockets form um, the drawer. Um, so that is kind of like the um, unit. So there's not just one per system, but like one per chip. Um, that is shared between those formats. And as you might have guessed, IBM have not adopted the BFLOAT 16 format here, but uh, their own proposed um, deep learning float uh, format. And while well, they have um, um, prepared an open source um, library to then wrap um, the um, instructions um, so that, well, in case anything changes over time, you have kind of a um, compatibility uh, layer in this. In particular, since those instructions appear to be uh, slightly more complex than some of the others that have been shown before. Moving on to the actual accelerators now. So in general, when I'm talking about an accelerator, this is kind of like a block diagram where the accelerator is a kind of a black box that you give um, first of all the um, some form of configuration data, mostly the uh, weight factors and the exact structure of the neural network with its layers. Um, you provide input data and at some point you receive a notification that it's done processing and that output data is available that you can then obtain from. Intentionally shown very general to um, cover, you know, like AXI in-memory interfaces as well as PCI, as well as any kind of uh, message passing um, interfaces here as well. Now, um, what most people will probably be thinking of when they're um, thinking about deep learning these days is like high-powered graphics cards, because, well, for one, many systems have graphic cards anyway, and, well, um, NVIDIA and uh, some others have been working to um, put a lot of tensor processing power into those graphic cards because it's been needed for image processing anyway. Um, but this is not what this presentation is about. So um, I'll leave GPUs mostly as a side. Um, for those that are interested in that, we have graphics experts into the labs. That's not necessarily me. Uh, we have a module available for um, customers that is not hosted by Zusa, but rather by NVIDIA for people that want to um, exploit such uh, cards and libraries, both for x86-64 and ARCH-64 by now. Um, also, when you're looking at the embedded systems from NVIDIA, there are downstream um, GPU drivers that don't have the same um, constraints as the PCIe cards. Um, and of course, while well, there are GPU discrete GPU cards as well as built-in GPU cards um, from multiple vendors that can be used to the same effect just with, well, different libraries then. Now, um, in general, um, when we are moving from a single core system to systems where you want to have like more parallel processing power. Um, of course, uh, most of us are familiar with uh, multi-processing um, systems, multi-core systems in, in whatever form uh, where you might have multiple clusters of CPUs and you have a, a memory coherent system where like kind of all the cores are treated more or less equal. But as you start to, um, well, insert more and more codes into a sorry, more and more cores into a chip, um, you get interesting effects in that uh, movement of data may no longer be um, equally expensive between cores. So it may be cheaper to um, transfer data to neighboring cores than to some global memory storage. And that then leads to the topic of potential data flows in that you can actually program cores to build some kind of a pipeline data flow um, to, well, have some form of grid mesh that then um, processes data, moves it on to a neighboring processing unit and uh, um, to some, you know, like from some input point to some output point um, as a, um, well, yeah, processing pipeline, like I said. There's all kind of shapes that you can then um, organize that in. You can, you know, have a pipeline here on the right, as I was mentioning, you can have like a ring data shape with, you know, maybe something is in the middle, like some form of cache memory or something. Um, the classical grid mesh, a checker mesh, um, or possibly even a 3D cube structure. Um, 
And um, well, the interconnect um, between those nodes is then usually referred to as network on chip. There's various kinds that then can have different properties um, depending on the specific vendors on well, whether there are you know ways that uh, you can address one individual, let's say deep core in the middle of such a grid, or whether you would only be able to transfer data to the um, outer cores and then have the cores uh, pass them on along uh, among themselves. Um, yeah, I'll get to the memory um, topic next. So on the left, um, you see the classical um, von Neumann um, architecture where you have the CPU as the um, unit that is interacting directly with um, any RAM um, and then performing the um, input and output um, marked in blue over here. Um, that can th that then got extended over time with uh, direct memory access, uh, as uh, many of you will be familiar with, um, so that the CPU can essentially just um, initiate a data transfer, but not need to read the data into its registers first before writing it out from its um, registers again. Um, and um, well, the trend that is observable here in uh, machine learning accelerators at the moment, very extreme, is that on the one hand, you will be familiar that, for example, the NVIDIA um, A100 graphic cards has up to 80 gigabyte of local memory on the card, in addition to the memory that is connected to the actual um, host CPU. Um, but um, there has been a growing trend to actually have more and more SRAM. And this is getting into really extreme uh, ranges by now. So this is not a typo. So I really, really did copy the number of 40 gigabyte on a wafer scale chip and 800 megabytes for a, well, let's say more or less regular size um, chip. Now, um, if you've heard about, you know, like reports and all about the Tesla chip that came down of, I think, like 442.5 megabyte only by my calculation. So that's not even the uh, top range um, of uh, chips that has been developed there lately. And of course, um, well, vendors are free to arrange that memory any way they like. They can have like, you know, like a big bar as a um, depicted on the top here, but they can also have, as was explained on the previous slide, some form of network on chip down here, and possibly even within each core have some form of uh, data flow pipeline yet again. Um, and well, of course, one thing of note is that um, if you actually have DDR um, RAM on the chip, then you need some form of uh, DDR controller that does the initialization of that. Well, because, well, yeah, DDR4 in it, um, doing that in open source code from the Linux kernel is a bit problematic at times. Um, so you may want to have some form of a microcontroller core to have that done for us and then only have some like firmware blob or maybe even ROM um, handle that. Um, and then, you know, it depends really on does the um, like a border um, core here have access to the DDR RAM um, or um, yeah, how, how exactly is that going to be handled by the individual um, vendor? And of course, the interesting thing for software then is, well, if you have um, a PCI card as kind of is sketched here, um, what is the um, PCI bar going to be representative of? So if you write data in sequence to one bar, is it actually going to go to one big block of memory as depicted up here? Or might it actually be going to like tiny bits of memory that are like spread all over the chip? So it would be interesting to see if there is going to be, so at the moment, kind of, it seems that uh, vendors are expecting the user to know which chip they're interacting with and to have the upfront knowledge of uh, how it's structured. Um, but of course, well, as a distro, we would be kind of interested in having um, hardware be pluggable into a system and software then scaling and adapting to the particular hardware that is in that system. Now, one thing to consider then is if you have SRAM sprinkled, sorry, static, static RAM sprinkled all over um, your chip is um, flipping the, the side. So um, could you just actually have a memory chip 
that has like the processing unit um, implanted into that. So there are two approaches um, I've seen for that, at least demonstrated, although not uh, fully um, purchasable yet, or at least, well, there is one appliance that is supposedly for purchase, but uh, no DIMMs yet with that that I'm familiar with. So um, if you have high, sorry, if you have high bandwidth memory, that is essentially like, um, um, you know, um, integrated directly physically on top of the um, system on chip, um, then it's kind of easy to have like some form of channel, let's say like an XE bus interface um, that would allow you to say, okay, the following memory in interfaces should be um, processing a particular risk opcode for the next reads, like, you know, like doing some kind of Mac or addition or whatever um, processing for the um, following uh, memory reads. Of course, that raises interesting questions about speculative memory accesses and uh, how do we avoid um, accidentally uh, invoking some of those functionalities for uh, non-aware software, as well as if you actually don't have it integrated into your chip, but as a pluggable um, DIM, then how do you detect that this is actually um, present or not present and where and in which form is it actually present and applicable to the software? Another interesting thing is that uh, vendors have actually started to complement the digital transistor-based um, calculations, which then require some form of input and output storage um, with analog computing. So one way here is a mixed signal, uh, when you actually um, combine the digital, um, like discrete um, values um, with, you know, like um, high active or low active um, voltages with, um, well, yeah, analog voltage levels, like um, continuous voltage levels um, by using a digital to analog converter. Um, and then, for example, using a variable resistors controlled by another um, voltage induced by a DAC um, to then, um, um, well, generate an output um, current and measuring that back with an analog to digital converter. Um, with that, well, um, you avoid a bit of storage in uh, for, for the for the weights um, in, down here. Um, you are no longer bound to uh, clock cycles within that um, framework. However, of course, you still have those um, DAC and ADC components that are a part of the digital domain. So um, you're essentially bound by the speed, yet you can get the data in and out of the analog domain. You can even take that one step further and uh, instead of uh, voltages, which might be maybe easiest to, to understand here, um, do the same with light waves. So um, with uh, laser um, emitters um, controlling um, the exact like light intensity um, that would be um, going in. So like the amplitude through, a, um, again, a digital to analog converter from um, the um, input data. Um, you would then use something like um, a Machtzehnder interferometer, um, which is um, this uh, crazy thing depicted here, uh, where you um, actually, um, well, so the, the general idea is that um, with electrical current, you need to invest energy in actually to have like, you know, like the um, current flow whereas with light, you only need to invest energy in order to emit the light waves and to then modify the light waves. So uh, what they're doing here is they're actually using directional um, couplers 50-50 to um, um, collide to uh, light beams and then use a mechanical um, phase shifter um, to um, yeah, sh shift the, the phase of the light wave, um, which then with the next collision um, leads to either reducing or, uh, well, changing the, the amplitude of the light. And this can then be done um, repeatedly. 
and uh, ultimately you um, on the right hand side um, take a photosensitive uh, diode again and uh, measure the um, resulting um, voltage with an um, analog to digital converter and have a digital value again. Now um, due to the uh, physics behind um, uh, light waves you essentially can have like this um, phase difference here between two um, yeah, not really light waves, but those um, light paths um, here. Um, and uh, in doing so, you get a two by two matrix multiplication, uh, which is essentially the complicated um, formula down here, um, resulting from the individual um, components that are put in sequence here. And uh, that then gives you a two by two matrix with a, a one by two input vector. Uh, multiplication and by then cleverly combining uh, multiple of those units in this kind of um, checkered um, structure, you essentially get an n times n uh, matrix multiplication with light. Some more trend um, summarized here is that, well, yeah, um, chips are getting those things um, built in, in particular, well, the um, ARM and RISC V chips, those are, of course, then not necessarily the really powerful ones, um, but at least um, some of them are available in chips like, you know, um, Rock Chip, RK3399 Pro, um, NXP, IMX8 M Plus, um, or in RISC V with the, um, um, Star 5 JH7100 uh, found on the um, um, Beagle V Starlight uh, better boards um, that uh, some of you may have heard about. Another one is, well, initially there were some USB sticks that were being used to just, you know, plug into a Raspberry Pi or a notebook or something. Over time, um, a lot of systems have been adopting PCIe 4, but some vendors have um, said that the um, bandwidth and the um, energy that the um, PCI connectors provide um, are posing challenges for them already. So they are basically um, dumping even those um, um, extension interfaces and using simply um, Ethernet or fiber-based um, systems um, to um, achieve a higher um, interface um, speeds. Also, um, as was um, seen uh, two uh, slides ago, um, people are looking into not having those like standard sized um, chips, but really, really um, huge uh, wafer scale. Um, chips simply to not have like connections and interconnects between chips, but to have like the direct uh, connection and higher compute density on a single chip. Um, and in general, there is very little scale up between like, you know, like different frequencies or capabilities, but, um, but rather like uh, um, there is a design assumption that you will just simply take uh, one chip and take it either as is or have many, many of them in order to achieve um, higher performance. And uh, something that's uh, going to be interesting for compilers is that uh, as the density of compute cores increases, um, not even RISC-V is seeing um, um, adoption there, but really minimal RISC cores that have like as little die space as possible. And therefore um, things like, you know, speculative accesses and so on um, that we find on modern CPUs today um, are not available on such computational cores and rather any um, thinking about pipeline and utilization of the cores then is pushed back up to um, the software that is generating the um, code to be deployed on those um, cores. Very briefly, um, for time reasons, um, there are sensors that have machine learning um, capabilities inside them, so you don't need to do the processing on the CPU side then, um, at least for some pre-processing. Um, another way is, well, camera sensors that are no longer giving you like the full frames that you then need to process for each frame that you receive on the host system, but you might actually get like a differential um, stream with uh, what actually changed, like the movement then showing up in dark and things that are um, yeah, statically either being like completely, well, white or light. Um, let me skip ahead a little. Um, so. Many of you will be familiar um, with um, those frameworks here, like for example, TensorFlow, 
um, many of them being written in uh, Python. Um, then there's like the layers of uh, ML ops um, on top of that, like um, the FuseML um, solution by SUSE. Um, looking below that, well, yeah, there is a, a whole mess of compilers in there. Well, in the Labs contest, I will say, well, that GCC is not being used there. A lot of things are based on LLVM or custom intermediate representations of the various ops. And well, this is the actual mess that I was mainly concerned about um, looking into this project. So um, the number of um, kernel drivers that are available in mainline is highly minimal. So Habana Labs, in the meantime, purchased by Intel, is pretty much the only real um, programmable cores that are um, available in uh, the main Linux kernel. There is also, well, in this case, well, an automotive DSP um, that you can load code into. Um, but, well, even Google managed to get their driver thrown out of staging because it wasn't really cleaned up to um, use existing interfaces. Um, Arm and NVIDIA um, have public code on GitHub for uh, downstream drivers, but most vendors, um, as was the case for, uh, well, graphic cards uh, years ago, um, are just keeping everything to themselves and are essentially, well, doing their own um, either proprietary or at least non-public implementations. Um, and I've asked a lot of them about that, and uh, it seems that at the moment this is uh, not yet improving. Now, my idea here um, for this project was um, to find some common ground um, of, you know, like, can there be any code sharing between drivers? Can there be a common interface from the kernel to user space that might inter um, um, facilitate both people um, contributing drivers in a more standard way, as well as then consuming them in a more standard way as far as the all those library layers go on top of the kernel driver. Um, and uh, unfortunately, um, I did not receive as much um, responses from vendors as I would have liked. And the responses that I did get are highly diverging in terms of the requirements that uh, are coming back. So um, as you might expect, there are, well, PCI cards that are using DMA data transfers, both for input as well as for output, maybe even in some cases for weights. Um, but um, that is not the case for um, all cards, obviously, and there might be direct data inputs to the chip that do not go via the CPU. Um, in other cases, it might just be non-DMA interfaces, like, for example, um, SPI, to um, the um, accelerator directly. And even the operations um, that I was hoping to find some, like, mandatory versus optional um, callbacks for a um, struct in the kernel um, are not really showing uh, much uh, homogeneous. So there are, well, some that are just using, like, one big binary blob and loading them into the accelerator. Um, but um, even like a reset operation is not unique because while well, you might have like different levels and areas that could would get reset. So unfortunately, I do not yet have a clear um, code proposal as part of this um, presentation. So very briefly, let's look about some context here. So um, Zusa has uh, joined the SOFI um, special interest group um, looking into um, an architecture for um, applying cloud native technologies to um, embedded systems, mainly coming from the automotive space, but not necessarily restricted to that. And uh, there is going to be a requirement that those uh, container workloads want to consume a uh, machine learning accelerators and some interface uh, will be needed for that. Now they will want to say, okay, um, this workload needs an accelerator, so it needs to be scheduled on a particular system that has one available. Um, but uh, at this point in time, I still see it as unclear of having like a generalized way to actually um, do that and also, well, uh, what do we do if we actually have two containers competing about a machine learning accelerator or possibly even virtual machines um, or, um, well, yeah, um, maybe even a um, multi-tenant scenario where not everyone um, is supposed to see all the data. 
Um, so while those cloud native solutions are desirable for certain use cases, um, we also need to keep in mind that uh, the Linux kernel is going to run underneath. So um, there are lots of those vendor provided and proposed solutions out there that people could adopt and experiment with. However, if they're not actually based on a mainline Linux kernel and not based on solid drivers, then essentially people will be put out of their um, user Linux support, um, which is obviously not a desirable um, outcome anyway. So that's the reason why some effort may be needed to um, to come up with sensible interfaces that allow to improve the driver situation so that a more generic way to network both the kernel layer and those Python frameworks um, on top that people will want to consume can be found and make this uh, much more easier. And ultimately, what I've been working towards but uh, not yet uh, ready to actually have something working, is to have um, a um, particular small demo, um, to have um, not just still images that are then like, you know, like recognized, is it a parrot or not, as well as one particular Google example, as you might be aware, um, but to actually take live um, video input, which then gives us also like some um, performance considerations, like for example, um, do we really need to get all the data into user space first, into like some variable type Python objects and then back, or are there actually ways that we could exploit peer-to-peer -peer DMA between like an input device and the machine learning accelerator and potentially also output devices. Um, of course, there are problems with that in that, well, uh, machine learning accelerators are not the only devices that are lacking drivers. There's also like um, certain um, protocols that are absolutely not open and not allowing um, implementations on kernel or user space level in open source code. Um, and uh, yeah, um, the question is then, you know, how do we arrive at some form of usable uh, user space application that allows us to interact with some uh, prototype kernel driver um, and uh, only then in the second step, uh, one that is uh, known working, um, I think does it make sense to look at the higher levels um, of how to integrate that. I hope that we have now, yes, made it to the end with uh, very few minutes for questions. Thank you very much for your attention so far. Dario, do we have anything accumulated yet? Uh, and uh, I'm saying uh, something about uh, AAC, I think again, um, something is coming so it's from Trump. You want me out or? Uh, Hello, Andreas, this is Giovanni uh, from Prague. Uh, I don't know if you can hear me. Uh, try to share my webcam yes, as I well. I can hear you better than Dario. <laughs> uh, yes, okay, great. Uh, great. Um, so I wanted to um, ask you to repeat your, your comments on two aspects that you have uh, described in your presentation. The first one is the role of the general purpose operating system. It seems like uh, though this uh, advanced hardware must have a lot of firmware and uh, the the kernel is sort of retreating in relevance as in all the um, uh, all the smarts or the the software is actually uh, in the firmware of this hardware so this is remark number one that i would like to comment and remark number two is about the tool chain to uh, program these devices it seems like a lot of it is proprietary as you mentioned um, so um, what is the landscape in that regard if we are uh, going towards a retreat of uh, open source tool chain and uh, you only have uh, proprietary tools uh, to work with which not as accessible as open source ones so thank you for getting back to that. I kind of skipped a bit over that, admittedly. So um, what I've been observing is that many vendors um, have been adopting this approach that you know we used to know from like 
graphic cards um, vendors where you had like kind of like a dumb kernel driver whose main function was to essentially like, you know, let user space do what it wants to do and then let user space choose any license that uh, they want to choose for that, including proprietary ones. Um, that is also have been the case with the Google driver, although there was an open source library available for that, but kind of the keyword there is a user space IO, UIO as a framework that may be usable there. Um, and uh, with regards to compilers, yes, I only depicted the, I'm sorry, left key is not working here. Um, I only depicted the um, open source ones as the ones that, well, I guess we care about. Um, there are, of course, like also a number of um, vendor provided compilers that then generate like this binary that would then get either flashed or loaded as a firmware blob into the um, into the MLA on startup. Um, those are often proprietary. Um, and uh, well, yeah, um, not all, um, let's say not all code generation makes it into LLVM directly, but it's like, you know, spread all over those uh, competing um, compiler framework when it actually is um, open source. Any follow-up question, Giovanni? Yeah. So I would say it's not you. so much the the firmware um, that is the restriction when we're dealing with the uh, um, when we're dealing with the um, cards. Luckily, not. But it's rather the uh, kernel user face um, interface that is the restriction at the moment. Okay, and I think we are out of time. Sorry for before, the wrong mic was selected, so you couldn't hear me very well. I was just thanking you, uh, by the way. And um, yeah, and thank you again. And I'm stopping the recording now since we are done.